Hey, so you've seen this before. You've seen it as a background for some of my YouTube videos and it's a PC that I built a couple of years ago and for the most part, it's pretty good, but it does have a couple of issues. Let me show you. So what we've got here is a Ryzen 5 3600 cooled by a Noctua C14S, an L-shaped cooler, very nice cooler by the way, on an X570 motherboard from ASRock. It's got an RTX 2080 Super and 32 gigs of 3200 megahertz CL16 RAM. There's two problems, a single 120mm fan for intake and another one over here for exhaust, which is really not that much airflow compared to cases that support higher end CPUs. The other problem is that the GPU is right at the bottom. The problem is the exhaust air from the GPU just pools over here because this is a glass side panel. If it was mesh, it would probably help because every time I take the panel off, it drops by a few degrees. But really the other problem is this was never meant to be the final form. See, I built this a couple of years back and I purposely chose the Ryzen 5 3600 because I knew that AMD had a 5000 series in its plans and I knew that they're going to give one more generation of CPUs before they write off this AM4 platform. And if that's the case, then well, my thinking was I'd buy the medium level CPU, which is still a very nice CPU, and then upgrade to a Ryzen 9 5000 series when it finally comes out. So. I did. That cooler is probably just about going to be enough, but there's no overclocking or turbo boosting headroom. Plus the case airflow, it's just not going to be good enough for something that is going to harness a Ryzen 9 5900X. And I definitely want to change that GPU mounting and give it a little more room to breathe. So hopefully, we address all of these things today. But first I'd like to really measure the performance difference. I ran Fermark for a good 13, 14 minutes and the GPU basically rose all the way to 81 degrees and then achieved stability. And the average FPS was around 54, 55 FPS. And that's pretty good performance overall. And 81 degrees does mean that despite the fact that it is a little bit warm in here, it's still performing below its limits and it's performing to its maximum potential. So there's no issues there. But when I played Apex Legends, I did notice a little bit of an issue. Now, at 1440p, the max frame rate was about 160, 190 frames per second. At 1080p, it went all the way up to 290 frames per second, but that was just the highest. When there was a lot of action, a lot of people around, a lot of smoke and effects and whatnot, it would drop down to as low as 120, 130 frames per second. And the problem is when it's jumping up and down that much, visually, there is a difference. It's not quite as smooth as holding a rock steady 120, 140 frames per second. Now, my other use case is actually video editing for YouTube and I shoot in 4K. When I try and edit it, it is absolutely chugging on my Ryzen 5 3600. 1080p video even, the moment I add layers to it, like a little bit of text and whatnot, it starts to have difficulty rendering it. Now, I also think that render times will improve drastically because, well, it's a Ryzen 9. And to test that, I'm taking two videos as samples. Now, the final audio ZD3000 review that I posted took about 11 minutes and 30 seconds on the Ryzen 5 3600 to render. And the Sony LinkBuds video, which was a fascinating device by the way you should go check out that review it took about 13 minutes and 22 seconds to render so i'm going to re-render these to see how much of an advantage i've got now using this much much higher end cpu so i guess let's get started never done something like this before i don't really have a setup with a table in front and a nice overhead camera and all those things so I'm gonna have to make do. GoPro with Joby Gorilla thingy with suction cup equals overhead camera, sort of. I mean, it doesn't work in low light, but I do have a solution for that. Huh? Overhead cam with lights for a small sensor camera. Boom! Unboxing slash building workplace. Okay, now we can get started. Okay, we're going to start off small and work our way up. So first up is the Ryzen 9 5900X Sapu. Ah, 12 cores, 24 threads, PCIe Gen 4. Wow, the case is literally empty. There's nothing there because anyone who buys a Ryzen 9 5900X is probably not going to use it with a stock cooler. It's got a little sticker too, which I can put on my case, which I absolutely will not. A reminder that your motherboard has to have a compatible BIOS. That is a good reminder to have. If you're trying this at home, if you're upgrading your CPU, then it is well worth going to your motherboard manufacturer's website and checking if there are any BIOS updates required for this new CPU. Also, you really don't want interrupted power supply during this because you might break your motherboard. So if you live in an area where you have interrupted power supply, maybe get some sort of backup power supply. Just saying. Next up, ta-da! The Arctic, oh, this way. 
the Arctic Liquid Freezer 280. Now this is an AIO, an all-in-one liquid cooler. And as I started to unbox it, I started to get a bit cocky. I'm sure it's easier than it looks. I'm sure the manual will tell us exactly what to do. How hard can this be? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call hubris. There's a couple of nice touches here, actually. If you can see, the connectors between the cable and the radiator, it's a nice little dark nickel kind of look. Same thing over here, more dark nickel over here. Oh, look at that. I mean, it's not the most aesthetic, clean, minimal thing, but oh, this thing looks so good. Indeed it was, and while I was busy ogling my new position, I missed something huge. This is the real hero of the day over here. There, right there massive dent that I completely did not notice because I was too busy talking about the fans. 140mm fans are the best because they can run slower but because they're bigger than normal fans and that means silent operation but with good airflow. That's exactly what we want. Well, ideally we want a non-dented AIO but what's astonishing here is I continue to not notice it right up to the point where I try and install it in the case. And finally, Corsair. No, no, the Cooler Master Masterbox NR200P. This is probably the best value for money, best airflow, best looking ITX design out there in the market today. You can get nicer things, but they're a lot more expensive. This is, this is for the people, for you and me. Hey. The NR200P actually comes with a tempered glass panel as well as mesh side panel so you get to choose which you want based on whether you want looks or airflow. I don't really care, I just want the best airflow right now and then we can finesse later so... Look at that, that looks nice. Now at this point I realized that the GoPro had actually died. So I thought I'd get myself some lunch, something nice and healthy. I thought I'd do a little vlog style mukbang. What I didn't realize was the microphone had also died so yep. I'm an idiot. Check, check, check. Oh yeah, no more chances taken. Okay, I haven't taken this off in a while, so I don't know what to expect. Nope, it just comes off just like that. Oh, look at those guys. Isn't that pretty? The Gigabyte RTX 2080 Super something, something, something else, something else. I actually repasted this a few days ago and it's been running a lot cooler since then. We'll see if we can do even better now. Okay, looks like we've got that. And finally, we need to take out our SFX power supply. So there's our power supply. Uh, does anyone else get reminded of that octopus tentacle thing from Matrix? Haha! Scanning, scanning. And now I think we're ready to bring back today's case. Let me just get all the stuff out of the way. Now it says the next step is to take off the PSU mounting thingy. Then we plop in our motherboard. Okay. Okay, now before I put the motherboard back into the new case, I should probably remove the mounting brackets that were there for the Noctua cooler and also take the processor off that. That's probably a good idea. Ew, isopropyl alcohol time. Oh, look at that. That's actually easy to take off. This is the Ryzen 5 3600. Excellent chip, like really, really solid workhorse. Just, you know, it's just naturally limited. That's fine, not its fault. This motherboard on the other hand, no, it has some really interesting quirks we should talk about. Quirk number one is uh, the fact that the SSD is on the back of this motherboard, which means if you're gonna be using an NVMe SSD, which you really should be, then go for one that you're not gonna upgrade for a while and then just forget about it. Forget about the other thing is that despite it being an AMD based motherboard, it doesn't support the AM4 mounting hardware. It supports an LG115X, which is the Intel mounting hardware. I assume it's to save some space. I don't know, but it's something to keep in mind. Now I wanted to mount the AIO on the side panel and intake fresh air from the side. To do this, I had to reverse the fans because the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 in stock configuration comes exhausting the air from inside the case. It ever occurred to you that there's something wrong with this mounting mechanism, right? Why are there so many parts? There's got to be an easier way to make this. I refuse to believe that this is the best way to do this. It's just unnecessary steps. Oh, buddy, you have no idea. Okay, so some small hiccups on the way. The build's taking a little longer than I anticipated. Maybe partly because I haven't built something in a while, uh, partly because my particular motherboard is a little bit tricky and I was, you know, I spent a little time worrying about the AIO. I shouldn't have because it actually worked out pretty okay. Also, <laughs> my GoPro died on me twice. And then finally, to be fair, my dog wanted to go out because, I mean, if I'd be cooped up in the house, I'd want to get out as well. So get the nice, cool, fresh air before summer in Dubai really hits in a couple of weeks. So I really don't mind being out here. A little bit of a walk and then we'll get back to the build. I'll see you then. Now, remember when I said my GoPros were dying? 
Well, it's working now, but my main camera died and I have to wait for it to recharge and it's taking ages. Now, I could wait for it or I could just get a heck on with it with a voiceover. Let's do that. Next up, we should look at the manual and point at a step as if we know exactly what we're doing. Well, we had our PSU out, so it was time to lock our motherboard down and put our PSU in its shroud and attach it to the case. Now, the NR200P actually gives you two mounting options, one like this and one against the back leg. So, to accommodate both mini ITX and mini DTX motherboards, more customization, more options, good for everyone. Also, you'll notice the back is completely open, which means for this particular motherboard, that SSD is completely accessible. Plus, it comes with the cutest little purple USB header. Next, we connect the power supply and any SATA SSDs you might have to the motherboard. One word of advice. You might want to put the SATA connectors in first and you might not want to bang your head against the wall. Just saying. Fair enough. Next in, our GPU goes in with a satisfying thwack and then our SSDs get mounted to the front of the case with a toolless mounting mechanism. Well done, Cooler Master. Now the NR200P also comes with two sickle flow fans in the box, 120mm each and these two have a really nice toolless mounting mechanism at the top of the case. Now for some thermal pasty time, apply that on the processor, try and put the CPU block on and boy is it a tight fit. Also every day is thumbscrew appreciation day. What would we even do in a small mini ITX build like this without the convenience of thumbscrews? Now that everything was in, everything was connected, all the headers were in place, it was time to power this puppy up. We wait with bated breath in anticipation as we see the gigabyte logo light up, we see the fans on the CPU block light up and we have RGB on the RAM. Ladies and gentlemen, we have liftoff. The only question is, will it post? Will we get a display? Will this boot up? Yes, yes it will, ladies and gentlemen, we have lift off and we booted into Windows. Okay lads, we finally got it done. Here it is, that's the build. There it is, it's running Windows, but what you saw just now in the video was just the beginning of my problems. Not only had I had a horrible day with my cameras and microphones failing and whatnot, now that the build was actually complete, it was giving me three major problems. Number one was a clicking and whirring sound that went up and down with the fans. So I feared the worst and I thought maybe there's a problem with the AIO, maybe the water pump is acting up, or it could just be one of the case fans. I didn't know. The other problem was both CPU and GPU temps were through the roof. We're talking 97 degrees Celsius on the CPU with, with a, like a reasonable load. And that is way beyond what I expected given that this thing is water cooled now. Even with a dent in the radiator, it should have been doing better than that for sure. Now, the GPU problem I figured out fairly quickly. Just like my old case, this case has the GPU mounted at the bottom. Because it's bottom mounted, despite the fact that it's a mesh case, the bottom of the side panel is actually fully closed off. So where the GPU exhausts air out of the side, well, all that air just pulls up there. The exact same issue I had in my previous case, the Lian Li TU150. I solved that just the way I solved it last time. I put two slim Noctua fans at the bottom and yes, I know that's an ugly solution because of the color, but it works beautifully. Not only do the slim fans force fresh air into the GPU, but they also force that pooled hot air to move on upwards and either get exhausted via the mesh side panels or via the AIO radiator and that solved the GPU problem straight away. The next problem was the CPU. and. This was where I feared the worst. The first thing was to see where that clicking noise was coming from. It turns out, thankfully, it was actually one of the Cooler Master sickle flow fans that came along with the case. One of these fans would make that clicking whirring noise. So I removed the fans, I put in my old Noctua fans and that problem just went away. Temperatures, however, were still an issue. Now, if you recall, I actually switched out the 140mm fans from an exhaust to an intake. I wanted to pull cool air from the outside into the case through the radiator. Now, I thought the problem was that because of this, I had to run the fans at a higher RPM to be able to pull air through the radiator. I tried that, it still didn't work. Temperatures were just not going down. So I decided to shut everything off, 
take it apart and had a look at the CPU and it looked, if I look very closely, it looked like the contact surface between the CPU block and the CPU itself were very close but not quite touching. It's very hard to see because the tolerances were very small but I decided to go ahead and remove one of the washers and this is where I realized something big. The Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 280mmeio has one major issue. The installation hardware is on the one hand quite complicated, more than it needs to be and on the other the manual seems to tell you to use a certain kind of washer that for me at least didn't actually come in the case. There are three kinds of washers that come with the liquid freezer too. You've got these thick donut like rubber ones, you've got these standard thin metal ones and then you've got these paper stickers. Yeah that's right they have paper stickers for washers which to my mind points to maybe an issue with manufacturing tolerances. That is definitely not a great thing. Nonetheless the first thing I tried was to take off the paper washer and then remount the CPU block. This actually help temperatures a bit. Still not to the extent I'd expect an AIO cooler to perform. So then I had to head and try to take off the metal washer as well. And now finally the problem just went away. The Ryzen 9 5900X was now idling about 30 degrees Celsius above ambient. Now the room is at 25 degrees Celsius which means the CPU was running at a maximum of 55 degrees Celsius under idle loads. Usually hovered around 47 to 50 if I'm being honest. And that is just about as good as it gets for this chip. The question then was, how did it handle load? Well, I sent it through the Fermark test to test the GPU first. CPU temperatures did shoot up to the late 60s and sort of remained there, hit about 71 degrees, but the GPU was really under load and to its credit, it performed like it did in the old case. It never went above 77, 78 degrees with it sort of peaking out at about 80 degrees after about 10, 15 minutes of load. So I'm really happy with that performance. It's nowhere close to thermal throttling and it just worked fine. Then I stress tested the CPU and under load, it shot up to about 75, 76 degrees really quick, which surprised me. I thought it would be more gradual. But then as I went on, it hit about 81, 82 degrees and just flattened out. It never got above 82 degrees. But how did it actually work while gaming? Well, I played Apex Legends for science of course and at 1080p it didn't make a difference. The highest FPS was still around 290 which is what Apex Legends is capped out at and the lower frame rates seem to be slightly higher than on my Ryzen 5 3600 but not by much. But the 1440p workload is where things started to change. Don't get me wrong, maximum FPS wasn't that much more than the old setup but now the lowest FPS I got was about 120 to 130 frames at 1440p low settings and my 1% lows were also around 115 FPS and that meant I was getting much more consistent performance in gaming now. And when it came to DaVinci Resolve, I was actually able to scrub through 4K footage with better ease. It still wasn't perfect, mind you, because I'm using a codec that is inherently kind of difficult to work with in my particular software. However, when it came to render times, the difference was astonishing. Now the 4K render of the Final Audio ZE3000 with my Ryzen 5 3600 build took 11 minutes and 30 seconds. With this new chip, it only took 5 minutes and 47 seconds. That is half the time it took to render the previous one. And the Sony LinkPuds video, also a 4K render by the way, took about 13 minutes and 22 seconds on the old PC. This one finished it in 6 minutes and 41 seconds. Once again, half the time. Totally expected, I grant you. But the whole time, the CPU was whisper quiet after I tweaked the fan curves a little bit and the temperatures never went above 75 degrees. Even under the gaming load this thing is almost whisper quiet with the GPU just spinning up a little bit when it needs to when there's a lot going on. This was exactly what I expected, exactly what I hoped for and it's quite frankly a big relief given that I don't think my AIO, dented as it is, is going to get replaced anytime soon. I have sent an email to Arctic hoping that they would RMA it but I wouldn't hold my breath. Either ways though, the fact that it's working beautifully despite that is perhaps a testament to their build quality overall. Installation is definitely something we need to work on but the AIO itself works exactly as well as people said and this case, well, this case is a beauty of an ITX case and it's really small and it works really well and I could not 
recommend it more which means i now have a setup capable of proper 4k editing with really fast renders i have a setup that's capable of gaming at 1440p no issues whatsoever and because of this new cpu and the amount of ram i have this should be able to game at at least 1080p and stream also at 1080p continuously with just one pc for hours on end no drop frames no issues whatsoever maybe i should set up a little youtube stream and maybe if you guys join me we can talk a little about gaming about tech about bluetooth earbuds if you will tell me what you think in the comments down below and uh, i hope you enjoyed watching my utter misery <laughs> i'm glad it all worked out i'll see you in the next one stay happy stay peaceful stay colorful namaste